Welcome. On behalf of the National Transit Institute, I thank you for participating in the methodology for performance measurement and peer comparison in the public transportation industry webinar. The National Transit Institute develops, promotes, and delivers training and education programs for the public transit industry in the United States. Today, we are pleased to have the following presenters with us. Paul Rios is a principal engineer with Kittleson & Associates a transportation engineering and planning firm headquartered in Portland, Oregon. He was the principal investigator for their research projects that developed TCRP reports 88 and 141 on performance measurement and is currently serving as principal investigator for the third edition of TCRP's Transit Capacity and Quality of Service Manual. Victoria Perk is a senior research associate at the University of South Florida's Center for Urban Transportation Research. She has 18 years of experience in transit planning, transit performance evaluation, and peer benchmarking, survey design and analysis, and transportation economics. Ms. Perk is actively involved in the Transit Capacity and Quality of Service and Intermodal Passenger Facilities Committees of the Transportation Research Board and is a past chair of the AFTA Multimodal Operations Planning Committee. She is also an economics instructor at USF and currently a PhD candidate in economics. Catherine Koffel is a leader in applying private sector research techniques to the field of transit. Her areas of expertise include customer and survey research, performance reporting, and fair policy analysis. Catherine is chairman for the Transportation Research Board's Public Transportation Marketing and Fair Policy Committee and has her own consultant firm, Catherine Koffel Consulting. Linda Charrington is the program manager for the Transit Mobility Program at Texas A&M Transportation Institute. Linda has over 38 years of experience in public transportation with experience in research, consulting, and as a manager with the Regional Public Transit Authority. Albert Gann is a professor with the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Florida International University. Dr. Gann has been the developer of more than a dozen transportation software systems, including the nationally known Florida Transit Information System. Dr. Gann is a member of the TRB Committee on Transportation Planning Applications, the TRB Committee on Emerging and Innovative Public Transport and Technologies, the Data Committee of the Florida Model Task Force, and the ITE Committee on Intelligent Traffic Signal Operations. Now I will turn the presentation over to Paul. Uh, as we begin, I'll give you a, call, a brief outline of what we're going to be talking about. We have five speakers, uh, and we're going to be kind of handing off to each other as we go through the presentation. I'm going to start off by going over a few basic concepts about performance measurement and peer comparison that uh, will be good for the whole group to know before we dive into the, the meat of the webinar. Then Vicki will talk a little bit about the stakeholder outreach and lessons learned uh, portion of the research uh, where we look into what others had already done in, uh, on this topic. I'll come back and talk about the methodology that we developed for uh, doing performance measurement and peer comparison for public transit systems. Then I will have uh, two examples of how this methodology can be applied. Uh, Catherine will talk about applications for transit agencies, and Linda will talk about applications to state departments of transportation. Then Albert will come in and give a demonstration of the Florida Transit Information System, which is an online tool that lets you get access to the full national transit database. And as, uh, as part of that has incorporated the uh, methodology that we're going to be talking about today for uh, identifying peers uh, for a transit agency. Then I'll come back uh, for a wrap-up of uh, what we've covered during the presentation. Uh, a couple of acknowledgments. Uh, this was research conducted through the Transit Cooperative Research Program, Project G11. Uh, this research was overseen by an expert panel of representatives of transit agencies, state DOTs, uh, universities, consultants, and the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, we also got uh, a lot of support from a number of uh, transit agencies uh, and state DOTs around the country uh, in actually testing the methodology and a full list of all the people that uh, helped out in one way or, or another with the project appears in TCRP Report 141. So a few basic concepts. So I'll start off with uh, defining what performance measurement is. 
Performance measurement is the collection, evaluation, and reporting of data relating to how well an organization is performing its functions and meeting its objectives. And there are a couple of reasons why transit agencies might want to measure their performance. One would be because somebody else uh, requires them to, a federal or uh, the federal government, for example. Uh, most larger transit agencies have to uh, report certain performance measures to the National uh, Transit Database. And uh, other agencies that may provide funding may also have some requirements in terms of reporting certain aspects of uh, agency performance. Uh, an agency may want to measure its performance uh, for its own reasons, to, for example, to assess progress towards meeting uh, its own goals, or to support uh, agency management uh, in making decisions and evaluating the results of past decisions. Now, by themselves, performance measures provide a lot of data, but they don't provide any context. They can't determine whether performance is good, needs improvement, or is getting better. They just give you uh, a value, uh, a number, or a condition. And real value is obtained by comparing results to something else, comparing your performance to uh, an internal or external standard or target, to your past performance, or to your peers' performance. So peer comparison. This is an activity where an organization compares its performance to that of similar organizations or peers using a predetermined set of performance measures. Performing a peer comparison lets transit agencies see how a performance compares to that of other agencies that have similar characteristics. And we say similar here and not identical because you can't expect to find a, another organization that ha that's exactly like yours. Every transit agency is going to have its own unique characteristics. Uh, the purpose of doing a peer comparison by itself, it does not answer why uh, differences occur between agencies. It just tells you that there are differences. And by itself, a peer comparison does not identify what an agency could do uh, to improve its performance in areas where others are performing better. To be able to do that, you need to move on to benchmarking, which is the process of systematically seeking out best practices to emulate. And a European research project in the benchmarking defined four levels of benchmarking. The first level is trend analysis. This is basically just comparing your own current performance to your past performance and seeing if there's a, been a change or not. And level two is peer comparison. This helps you identify how good your performance can realistically get. But as I just said, it doesn't really tell you uh, what the reasons might have been for any differences in, in performance. At level three, an agency goes out and contacts other agencies, uh, its peers, uh, particularly the ones that are its best performing peers in a particular area. And this is to identify reasons for why there were differences in performance, uh, to identify best practices that the other agency is uh, conducting that you might be able to adapt or use in your own agency, uh, and potentially also to compare performance in the areas not included in the National Transit Database. For example, uh, service reliability is not something that's included as part of uh, in the NTD, for example, on-time performance. Finally, at the highest level of benchmarking, you have benchmarking networks. At this point, benchmarking is ingrained in the agency culture, and the agency is continually seeking out ways to improve its performance by collaborating with its peer agencies. So they'll agree to share information with you and potentially share costs in uh, evaluating your performance. And the agency uh, regularly shares its information with its peers. So these three concepts, uh, performance measurement, peer comparison, and benchmarking, are kind of the three major themes that we'll be carrying through uh, this presentation. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Vicki, who's going to talk about uh, the stakeholder outreach and some of the lessons that were learned uh, during the research. OK, thank you, Paul. Um, in addition to the literature review effort, uh, we conducted outreach that resulted in discussions with 31 individuals from 27 organizations, uh, including 14 transit agencies of varying sizes, five state DOTs, two MPOs, and six others. Uh, combined with the literature, this outreach led us to some lessons learned for conducting successful peer analyses. First, it may be obvious that the process used for grouping peers is the most important step, yet it is widely acknowledged to be the most difficult. Inappropriate peers lead to incorrect conclusions, useless results, and a lack of any confidence in follow-up actions based on the results. It is also important to remember that peers will not be identical, but should be similar. Of course, as mentioned earlier, no two agencies are exactly alike. It's also possible to learn from organizations outside the transit industry. 
Comparisons can be based on elements that are common or similar. We should be open to learning from anyone. The objective of any analysis should be defined first, and then appropriate measures should be selected and defined. It's important to measure things that are related to the agency's goals. Measure the things you're trying to achieve. Choose measures that are uniformly defined and reported, to the extent possible, to ensure you're really comparing the same things for all peers. Common databases, such as the National Transit Database or NTD, can obviously facilitate this, even though there can be some limitations. Of course, bad data leads to bad results. Buy-in is needed for management. Even better, a champion can help ensure the proper support and resources are provided for any effort. This buy-in and support is also necessary to initiate any changes based on the results. Otherwise, it's all just a paper exercise and a waste of resources. And rather than conducting peer analyses sporadically or just packing them on to other efforts ad hoc, it's better to take a longer-term approach to better track trends and help identify whether particularly high or low performance is a one-time thing or sustained over a period of time. Finally, the ultimate goal of the effort will fundamentally affect stakeholders' attitudes toward it. If it appears the goal is to, quote, grade the agency or rank the agency, this might lead to defensiveness and avoidance. However, if it is made clear that the purpose is to learn and improve, that will lead to more cooperative, proactive reactions. The latter is probably the better approach. In most cases, the focus should be less on specific rankings and more on how to best use the resulting information. No one is going to be the best at everything, so why not learn as much as you can from the analysis? Public transit is, of course, a customer-based business. Remember the customer. Better performance can attract and maintain ridership, lower costs, or both. An important part of benchmarking networks, as Paul mentioned, is data confidentiality. As part of the network, agencies share data freely within the network. Participants are certainly more likely to share information that might be less than positive if they know it will be kept private. Another way of maintaining confidentiality is to hide agency names when results are shown publicly. Outside such networks, there can be concerns about data confidentiality. Of course, in the U.S., the NTD is publicly available, although some data, such as uh, the safety and security data, are not released publicly. The wide availability of these data makes it possible for others to compare transit performance in ways that transit agencies may not agree with. However, to go beyond publicly available databases such as NTD, agencies need to be contacted directly to acquire data or other information, such as survey results, etc. There are reasonable upper and lower limits to the optimal number of peers to use in an analysis. Too few, which means typically less than four, won't be enough to draw any meaningful conclusions. It is also hard to draw any meaningful conclusions from too many, as the peers will be too dissimilar, uh, not to mention it will be difficult to properly evaluate all the relevant information. As Paul mentioned earlier, benchmarking networks represent the highest level of benchmarking. Participants in these networks can focus on issues of mutual concern. Data are defined and collected in a consistent manner within the group, and with the members working closely together, additional factors can, can be compared that might not exist in national databases. Network members have already agreed that they are sufficiently alike to be good peers. There are cost-sharing opportunities, too, where the network can pool resources to get more and better quality information than they could if they were each just working on their own. Staff can grow professionally as well as they connect and learn from staff at the peer agencies. Benchmarking networks can facilitate analyses of long-term trends, and they also maintain data confidentiality, uh, two success factors that were just mentioned. Successful benchmarking networks usually uh, also have an external facilitator. So it's clear to see how these networks are characterized by many of the success factors that I just discussed on the previous few slides. And now I will be turning it back over to Paul uh, for an overview of the methodology developed for this project. Okay, hey, thanks, Vicki. Uh, first, I'm going to talk a, uh, with a couple of slides about what we're trying to achieve with this methodology. First, our, our project oversight panel had five attributes that they wanted this methodology to have. They wanted it to be robust, uh, to be able to work with different transit modes, agency sizes, and operating environments. Uh, so this, this method is uh, mainly focused on larger systems, at least large enough to report to the National Transit Database, uh, because that's a key source of data. But within that, you can have different modes and different operating environments uh, among agencies. Now, it's not to say that this method can't be applied to smaller agencies, uh, and we recognize there is a rural NTD that has come out. 
but it's not as easy to work with in terms of obtaining data at this point as the uh, the larger uh, original NTD is. Uh, so you can apply this to smaller systems uh, that don't report to the NTD, but it'll take a little bit more work. Next attribute is uh, practicality. They want it to be relevant to and usable by transit agencies, state DOTs, and other interested stakeholders. They want it to be transparent so that you can see uh, what inputs were used by the methodology, uh, how the peers were selected, and any intermediate results. They want it to be uniform, that any performance measures that were used uh, as part of the methodology uh, used readily available and uniformly defined and reported data. And they want it to be innovative. They want it to go beyond traditional performance measures and avoid approaches that have not been adopted by the public transportation industry. Now, on top of these five attributes, we added three more of our own. One was adaptable. Uh, we recognize that not every user is going to share the, the whole philosophy that underlies our methodology. And so we wanted to be able to make the methodology flexible enough that people could adapt it for their own use and not be locked into a single approach. Uh, so we provide the framework and, and guidance on how to apply the methodology, but uh, you're not locked into a single way of, of doing things. And we'll explain that as we go through the, the presentation. We want it to be accessible to users, so not just provide a report, but actually a tool that people could use to apply the methodology. And Albert will be demonstrating the tool that you can apply to find peers and, and measure your performance and compare it to your peers. And finally, we wanted to have the process be updatable, recognizing that the research funding stops at the end of the project. Uh, we wanted to be make the methodology usable into the future. So we described a process for how the factors for selecting peers are calculated so that people could uh, calculate these in the future using data from national databases. There are eight steps to the methodology. It may seem at first glance it's kind of complicated. These are Most of these steps are steps to uh, do as part of any kind of performance measurement process. Uh, what we're going to be focusing on are mainly steps two through five, which are dealing with the performance measurement and uh, peer grouping aspects of it. Uh, but the full methodology it involves eight steps from understanding the context of the the question you're trying to, to answer all the way through identifying your performance and uh, identifying potential areas that you can improve in uh, and developing strategies to address uh, those those weak areas of weakness. Uh, also, as indicated in this uh, figure, not every step necessarily has to be performed depending on the kind of analysis that you're doing. If you're doing a trend analysis, for example, and just comparing your past performance to yourself, you can skip several, several of these steps. If you're doing a full benchmarking process, then you go through the entire set of steps. So let's start at step one, understanding the context of the exercise. There are many possible reasons for performing a peer comparison. Some of these are one-time requests, where somebody wants a, a quick uh, uh, answer to a question. For example, the immediate request after a fare increase is announced, how does your uh, how do your fares compare to similar agencies uh, uh, in the state or around the country? Or it could be a more complicated one-time request, uh, for example, uh, as part of a transit agency planning process, uh, for example, a six-year plan update where you're measuring a whole bunch of uh, aspects of the transit agency performance, but you're only doing it as part of that planning effort. It's not uh, a longer-term effort that survives past the planning effort. You can also do this, and we recommend actually doing this, as more of a permanent process where you uh, are regularly measuring your own performance and comparing it to your peers. Uh, so you can see uh, how you're doing and also how your peers are doing over time. And uh, agencies that get really involved in this process uh, set up permanent benchmarking networks. At the time we performed the, the research, there was uh, one benchmarking network that was uh, in, in action in the United States, and since this time, a second one has been uh, developed uh, along the lines of some global benchmarking, transit benchmarking networks uh, that have been set up uh, with some of the biggest uh, cities around the world. This involves uh, more of the larger systems in the United States. But anyway, the, the context of uh, what you're trying, what the reason for performing a pair comparison is going to dictate what level of effort is involved in uh, identifying peers and measuring performance and how much time you have available to, to do that. 
Moving on to step two, develop performance measures. At this point, you want to match your performance measures to your agency goals and objectives. And here the level of effort is going to help, is going to constrain what measures you have available to you. Again, referring to the four levels of benchmarking, uh, starting at level one or trend analysis, you can use any performance measure that your agency is capable of collecting because you're just comparing your own performance uh, against yourself. So you don't have to worry about if other agencies define performance uh, the same way as you do. Uh, you're just, you define it the way you want to and uh, you track your own performance. So this gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of defining performance measures and selecting performance measures. But again, you're only comparing your results to yourself. At level two peer comparison, you're limited to the performance measures that are available in national databases. And you're also restricted to how the database is defined a particular performance measure. Uh, so it's a little bit more limited there, uh, but it still, as we'll see in a moment, gives you uh, quite a range of measures that you can use to compare your performance. At level three, or agency contact, you may be able to use additional performance measures uh, if both agencies collect the, the data required to evaluate those measures and, and define the measures similarly. And then finally, in a benchmarking network, the entire group has agreed upon what measures they want to use and how they've defined them. Uh, so the group can use any measure that the group as a whole is capable of collecting. So that gives a benchmarking network great flexibility to, to measure anything that's of interest to them. So in terms of you know, guidance on selecting performance measures, TCRP Report 141 provides guidance on measures that are available nationally that could be used for, perform for performance measurement. These are typically measures that are either available directly from the National Transit Database or can be derived from other measures in the National Transit Database. And we've divided these into two main areas. One is outcome measures, and the other is descriptive measures. Outcome measures measure the result achieved for a given set of inputs. So it tells you what kind of results you achieved. And these are the, the key measures that you want to uh, measure first to identify where your areas of strength and weakness are. And we divide these into nine different topic areas, uh, for example, maintenance administration. Uh, so you can uh, find, uh, easily find measures that you can uh, relate to questions of interest. Now, the descriptive measures are also useful in that they describe agency characteristics and they provide insight into why results may vary between agencies. And they can help you drill down into some of the reasons why a particular agency might uh, have performance that's better or, or worse than, than your own performance. They're kind of secondary measures, but they're also valuable measures uh, in terms of helping to potentially explain why differences occur. Now, over and above these national, uh, nationally available and nationally defined performance measures, TCRP Report 141 also identifies some other useful measures that aren't available nationally. And you can use these either for internal use or uh, as part of a benchmarking network. And then also there's another report, TCRP Report 88, that provides a comprehensive set of transit performance measures and describes how and why to implement a transit performance measurement program. And so this report gives you a large set of measures and provides some guidance on, on how to define them. Again, you can use these for internal or benchmarking network use. Someone just asked, is there an upper limit on the number of measures? And this is probably an appropriate place to answer that question. TCP Report 88 uh, is a report on setting up a transit performance measurement system, basically an agency uh, system for regularly evaluating your own performance. And that report uh, recommends starting small, uh, say no more than a dozen measures or so, and then building from there as you get experience with, uh, with the performance measurement program. Uh, over time, you could have a large number of measures, some high-level measures if you report to the public or to your uh, transit agency board, for example, and then lower-level measures that help explain the results that, uh, that uh, managers of the agency or, or staff might use uh, that reflect their own particular area within the agency and how it reflect and how it impacts the, the overall agency performance. Uh, so it, uh, that report provides uh, 400 or so different performance measures that are used in the transit industry. And so, uh, if you're interested in measuring your own performance, uh, it's a good resource to use. Now, some of the sources that were available for national nationally available. Uh, 
performance measures of interest to transit agencies. Uh, these are listed on this slide. The National Transit Database is the, the biggest uh, source uh, because it, the, uh, the Federal Transit Administration has developed common measure de definitions and most transit agencies of any size report to it. Now, there's still some issues with reporting agencies not calculating some measures according to the official definition. But Report 141 highlights some of those measures that we found have problems during the project's testing phases. And we provide guidance on how to identify bad data and deal with it. So while we acknowledge that the NTD data isn't necessarily perfect, uh, it's the best that's out there. And uh, it has a lot of good information in it that you can use. And as I said, in Report 141, we uh, give you guidance on how to identify potentially bad data. Uh, other data sources that were used to help identify peer agencies include the U.S. Census Bureau, uh, measures we developed uh, directly as part of Project G11, uh, and then measures from other federal sources, for example, inflation rates, costs of living, and congestion data. And almost all of these different performance measures are available through the FTIS software tool that we'll be demonstrating a little bit later on in the webinar. Step three of the process is to establish a peer group. And here, the, the method that we developed through TCP Report 141 is to identify other transit agencies that are similar or what we say are, are like the agency being analyzed. And uh, the key things that go into this uh, determination of likeness uh, are transit modes operated, uh, particularly uh, is the agency only, does the agency operate some rail mode? or is it uh, mainly a, a bus and demand response uh, operating uh, agency. Uh, so this way it helps separate out so that uh, agencies that operate uh, rail rapid transit, for example, are compared to each other, uh, and agencies that are uh, bus only plus uh, ADA demand response, for example, are compared to each other. Uh, we also then identify transit agency characteristics. These are things that are partially or wholly under a transit agency's control, as well as service area characteristics, which are factors not under a transit agency's control. And I'll be giving examples of this on a, on a slide that's coming up. Uh, we also uh, include as a factor distance from the agency that's being evaluated. Uh, everything else being equal, uh, the w Report 141 method prefers nearby agencies. And uh, this is for two reasons. One, it's a surrogate for, for climate. Uh, so that agencies in the, the southwest, for example, are more likely to find uh, similar agencies that have a, a similar climate to them. Uh, it also means that stakeholders will be more likely to be familiar with an agency if it's one that's closer by. Uh, that being said, the, the method doesn't rule out uh, more far away agencies and included as peers. And in fact, if uh, a far away peer is included as a far away agency is included as a peer, it means that it's uh, very similar to the agency being studied in a number of areas. Uh, the farther away it is, the more alike it has to be in all these other areas in order to be considered as a peer. So just because it is far away, it doesn't mean that you should not consider it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the method does try to identify peers that are closer to you. So depending on the size of the urban area of the uh, transit agency being studied, and the type of analysis that you're performing, uh, comparing a specific mode, uh, for example, an agency's bus operations to another agency's bus operations, uh, or if you're doing an agency-wide comparison, including all the modes that an agency operates, uh, up to 14 factors could be used to identify peers. And this slide here identifies the different kinds of factors that are used. So things like vehicle miles operated and annual operating budget give a sense of uh, the size and scale of the transit agency's operations. Uh, service type is a very important factor, uh, so that if uh, an agency serves its entire urban area, the method tries to find other agencies that have similar service areas. So if an agency limits its service to uh, only uh, suburban areas or, or a few suburbs within a larger urban area, again, it will try to find agencies with similar types of service. Uh, percent service purchase and percent service demand response, uh, again, tries to see uh, if you are you contracting out more of your service or are you operating it yourself, and how much of your service is demand response, uh, again, to find agencies with similar characteristics to you. 
Then uh, there's a series of factors that relate to your uh, area's characteristics that a transit agency really has no control over. The area's population, its population density, the growth rate, uh, low-income population percentage. Uh, it has a factor for college students uh, because uh, college town transit systems uh, have very different characteristics than transit agencies serving similar-sized cities uh, that uh, don't have a, a college within them. And then similarly, state capital is a factor because it tends to have a lot more office workers than uh, uh, cities of a similar size. Uh, then finally, for, for larger systems, we have a couple of congestion-related uh, measures uh, which look at how competitive might transit be uh, compared to the automobile. Uh, now, there are many other factors that we tested as part of this project but did not include in the method. And there were three main reasons for this. One might be was that there was no comprehensive data source or definition that could be used. For example, parking costs. Uh, there was no there, there was data for some cities, but not on a wide enough national basis to be able to include it or consider it in, in methodology. Uh, some factors didn't help distinguish transit agency differences. For example, the percentage of seniors in the population. There wasn't enough variation between most regions. Uh, that it made a very good uh, factor for distinguishing one agency from another. Or in some cases, another factor that was included in our method captured similar differences. For example, zero-car households versus low-income population uh, both get at uh, the issue of do you have a, a car available to you or is uh, transit your, a, a main source of mobility for you. So each of these factors is assigned a likeness score, for example, population. And the closer the match, uh, with a little likeness score. And actually, the FTIS software tool that we use goes through all 600 or so transit agencies that report to the NTD and computes a likeness score for every single agency and compares it to the agency being uh, studied. Uh, so for population, for example, if your agency's population is 100,000 and another agency's population is 150,000 or 50 percent greater, it comes up to the, that means that the likeness score is 0 0.5. And for many of these factors, it's yeah. just a percentage difference between one agency uh, value and a, and a potential peer's value. For the other factors that aren't comparable by percentages, for example, the type of service, are you a suburban agency or a region-wide agency, then there's lookup tables uh, shown uh, in Report 141 and incorporated into the software tool that uh, are used to develop similar likeness scores. And here, one would be a noticeable difference between agencies, or two would be a significant difference. Uh, and then we use higher values to effectively eliminate some potential peers from consideration so that a rural agency should uh, never come up as a viable peer for uh, a large city, large urban area uh, system, for example. So how do you interpret these likeness scores? Uh, the likeness scores are for each, a likeness score is developed for each one of these uh, factors, up to 14 of them, depending on, on the circumstances. And then we average these to produce a total likeness score. Uh, if the score is less than 0.5, we consider that to be a good match, as close as two agencies can realistically get. Uh, again, you're never going to find anybody that's identical to you, but you can find ones that are, are close enough to be able to get good results from when doing a peer comparison. Uh, between 0.5 and 0.74 means it's a satisfactory match. There's some differences in some areas, but it's overall a, a fairly good match. Uh, between 0.75 and 0.99, it might be a potential peer, uh, but you also want to check out the individual factor scores to see if it's too different in a particular area to be usable as a potential peer. And if the total likeness score is one or more, that it's, uh, we consider that usually an undesirable peer, that there are too many differences to make it uh, a viable peer. So based on this method for developing likeness scores, potential peers may be fairly similar across the board. They may have uh, similar characteristics across all factors. They may vary significantly in one or two respects, but are very alike in most or all other respects or be located fairly far away, in which case they're often more alike than potential peers that are closer geographically. Now, all this math is done for you automatically through the FTS software tool, and it produces output at the end of the process that shows you uh, what your potential, what each, uh, all 600 potential peers' likeness scores were 
uh, as well as these factors. So if you're wondering why a particular agency was identified as a peer, or conversely, uh, another agency you think would be a good peer wasn't identified as a peer for you, you can go to the scores and find out why they were similar or dissimilar to you. So how many peers should you have? We recommend having at least four, uh, which gives you a, a enough com uh, agencies to get a viable comparison. Uh, eight would be ideal, uh, or perhaps up to 10. More than 10, you probably have too many agencies in the mix. Uh, uh, it's creating a lot more work for you without uh, making uh, really the results any better. Uh, usually you can find eight or 10 good peers uh, and that will be sufficient to, to identify what your strengths and weaknesses are. Now, as we did the testing, uh, we found that there are cases where uh, you weren't always able to get the ideal number of peers. Uh, larger transit agencies generally will may not be able to get the 8 to 10, to 10 ideal number of peers just because there's a smaller pool of potential peers to work with. There's only so many really large transit agencies in the U.S. Uh, in some cases, uh, largest in class agencies, uh, for example, the very largest bus only operating agencies in the country, uh, they may have a hard time filling out a full range of, of eight uh, uh, peers, just because most potential peers will either be smaller or they'll be operating other modes. Uh, transit agencies that are operating relatively uncommon modes uh, might have a fewer number of peers. And transit agencies of uncommon service types may have problems. For example, bus operators that serve multiple urban areas. Now, our, after this time, there's kind of a, a basic process for uh, identifying peers. But some questions may require additional screening factors that you'll have to develop yourself. And some of these might include funding sources. So we have an example in Report 141 of an agency that wanted to compare itself uh, to agencies that already had a dedicated fund, uh, source of transit funding. So this was an agency that didn't have a dedicated funding source, and it was curious, to get peers that did have dedicated funding, were they able to produce better results? Uh, so in this case, you need to do an additional screening to weed out potential peers that don't have a ded dedicated funding source because they aren't of interest to the question being asked. And so here you just screen out peers uh, on the basis of did they have a dedicated transit funding source or not. Uh, FTA funding categories might be uh, another question. Uh, we came across an agency that was interested, that was uh, just about to cross a population threshold where, where its uh, funding allocation from the FTA was going to change, and they wanted to compare themselves to agencies just on the other side of that threshold, just to get an idea of what their performance was like and what they might expect as their funding transition. Uh, you might be interested in specific climatic conditions over and above the distance based factor that's, be, that's built into the method. Or you might be interested in specific service types like commuter bus that uh, at the time we developed this research weren't covered in the NTD specifically. The NTD has, uh, uh, within the last year or so, started uh, a new category or, or mode that addresses commuter bus and bus rapid transit. Uh, and uh, a couple other modes. But at the time we performed this research, that data wasn't available. You just had motor bus as a mode, uh, so you weren't able to, to really separate out commuter bus just by using the NTD. And in some cases, uh, an agency might uh, determine in advance that some particular factor is really important, that, uh, that an agency shouldn't have a population more than, say, twice as big or 50% as big as uh, their area. Uh, and so you can set that in advance and uh, use that as a screening factor. In all these cases, we recommend you set these secondary screening factors in advance uh, to preserve the credibility of the triggered selection process, not use them after the fact to weed out agencies that uh, may make your, your own agency look bad in certain respects. So the methodology I just talked about went through uh, several stages of testing uh, before we finalized it and what you see now in Report 141. Uh, we had an initial concept and, out, uh, and went out to a, a number of transit agencies just to qu question them about what they thought about the initial concept even before we started fleshing it out. And we did a small-scale test with 16 agencies where each agency identified performance topic or question to be addressed. We applied the methodology, and then the agencies commented on the results and the appropriateness of the peers. 
Uh, we then updated the method and did a large-scale test. Uh, here uh, we had 22 agencies participating. And here each agency identified their own question to be addressed. And they would apply the methodology in the software and then commented on the results. And again, we made final revisions to the methodology. And, and the result of that is what you see now in Report 141. So what we've gone through now is kind of the, the new uh, things that Report 141 added. Uh, at this point, uh, we're moving more into a more of a traditional performance measurement process. So I'm going to go through this a little bit faster. Uh, but uh, at step four, you evaluate your performance. You use FTAS, for example, to uh, measure your performance using the performance measures that you've already identified. Uh, you may want to adjust your cost data. Uh, either for inflation or to account for differences in wage rates between different regions. Uh, we provide guidance on how to check data for possible problems uh, that may indicate a, a problem in the, in the data. Then we talk about how you can interpret the data to identify why the results uh, turned out the way that they did. Uh, and then finally, we give examples of how you might want to present the results to stakeholders. In step five, uh, you'll find out in most cases uh, that your agency has one or more areas where you're not the best performer among your peers. Uh, in that case, it can be a, a useful exercise to contact your peers that have better performance than you in, in those areas. Uh, one, to confirm that results are true, uh, not a result of uh, bad data in the NTD. Uh, and if uh, the results are true, to find out what are some of the things that that peer agency does to achieve that superior performance. Uh, our peer grouping process has already eliminated many of the external factors that could affect performance results. So at this point, uh, in many cases, uh, it's something that that peer agency is doing themselves that's, that's achieving the, the better performance. Uh, once you've found out what they can do, then you can think about how can you adapt that to your own agency. So at step six, you develop an implementation strategy, uh, identify a strategy and, and the process to implement that strategy uh, to improve your performance. Uh, one of the things that Report 88 identifies is that top-level management and board support is essential because they're the ones that will provide the, the funding support uh, for any kind of uh, implementation strategy. Now also at this step, contacting peers can also identify uh, unsuccessful strategies that have been tried in the past, so you don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel and, and, and waste time doing something that, that didn't work out for others. Step seven is implement the strategy. Now this is something that might seem obvious, but in Report 88, we found that the process often halted after a strategy was identified because there was a lack of funding or there was a lack of stakeholder or management support. But if you don't actually take steps to improve performance, then there really wasn't a whole lot of uh, purpose in doing all the work up to this point. Uh, and it can lower, uh, lower stakeholder confidence in the future if you try to do a peer comparison again, because people will think that nothing will come out of the effort. And finally, uh, in step eight, you monitor your performance. Uh, this is essential to see if your strategy is actually working as intended. If it is, then keep monitoring periodically, and in longer term, uh, go back and do another peer comparison, uh, because your peers have hopefully also been working to improve their own performance, so there may be something new to learn. And because you've already been through this process once, it should be easier the second time around. Uh, if your performance isn't improving as intended, then uh, go back to step six and, and identify a new strategy. OK, so that's sort of the methodology uh, in a nutshell. Now I'm going to turn over to Catherine to talk about potential applications for transit agencies. Thank you, Paul. I'm going to show how this eight-step process can be applied to a transit agency using the Utah Transit Authority as an example. Step one is to understand the context. And it's the operating context for the agency as well as the context of the performance question. The operating context is important when evaluating the appropriateness of potential peer agencies and also when considering strategies for improvement. I've provided the operating context for UTA on this slide. For the purpose of this example, the context of the performance question relates to efficiency and the budget. Yeah. As such, this is going to be an internal question that requires understanding and buy-in from both line managers in the short term and in the long term. 
Step two is to develop the performance question and the performance measures themselves. The transit agencies are publicly funded, and as such, they are always challenged to do more with less. Since operator wages typically make up the largest item of an agency budget, the performance question becomes, how can UTA create more efficient operator work schedules and therefore maximize service on the street? Chapter 3 of the report provides several suggested measures, which I have listed here. For this example, I'm going to use two measures, revenue to perform hours, which is a schedule efficiency measure, also revenue hours per operating employee. Having identified the performance question and measures, we're ready to select, we're ready for step three, which is selecting our peer agencies. I've used the STIS software, which I won't go through at this time because uh, Albert will be covering it later. But this slide shows a portion of the output of the peer selection. UTA is at the top with a total likeness score of zero, indicating that it is the target agency. From this, uh, that there are no peers with a good likeness score of under 0.5. San Jose is a satisfactory peer with a likeness score between 0.5 and 0.74. They're at 0.64. And then there are eight other potential peers that have likeness scores over 0.75 but less than one. I've highlighted the cells of potential peers that show significant differences. The first one there is Niagara Frontier in Buffalo, New York. It has a very similar population, urbanized population, to UTA. But you can see that the population growth rate is actually declining. As such, they probably have a very different set of issues than UTA is facing and the other peers who all have a positive population growth rate. Okay, then in Seattle, Minneapolis, and Denver, they all have urbanized populations more than double UTA with likeness scores well over one and therefore would not make very good peers. Give this our final peer bus list. Uh, that has Utah Transit Authority and five additional peer agencies. With this, we're ready to go on to step four, collecting and comparing the performance measure data. Again, I use the FTIS software, which uses the NTD database. Here are the step four results, comparing four years of data for each of the six agencies. The first call, set of columns is UTA, which is followed by TriMet, Charlotte, Austin, San Jose, and Sacramento. When you look at the first chart, the revenue to platform hours or the schedule efficiency, you can see that UTA is significantly below the peer agencies. Although the data comes from NTD and it should be standardized, it does raise the question of whether the revenue hour data of UTA is comparable to the peers. The second chart shows revenue hours per operating employee. UTA is lower than the peers, but is not that different from Sacramento and Charlotte. Austin, Texas, which is right in the middle of this set of bars, is very interesting in that in 2007 they were on par with UTA, but in 2009 they improved their performance to be on par with the top performing peers. Now that we've got the data, it's step five to contact the peer agencies, and step six would be to develop strategies. So the first question is whether the data is defined and reported the same way at UTA as for the peers, especially given that significant difference in UTA's revenue to platform hours ratio. For example, a common difference is that layover may or may not be included in UTA's revenue hours. And if it's not included, the data may need to be recalculated to create comparable statistics across all of the peers. If this can't be done, it's possible that a new measure will need to be selected. So once we've identified that the data and verified the data is comparable, peers can provide insight into the differences in performance and can suggest potential strategies for improvement. It is that UTA covers the significant rural area, which results in very high deadhead costs. Or do peers allow road release, reduces the deadhead time, 
of side-by-side -side assistance. Yeah, yeah. And the strategies that Austin implemented in 2009 also be applied to UTA so they could see the same kind of improvements. And finally, are there work rule or scheduling practices that can be changed, such as increasing the length of operator runs to provide more revenue hours per employee, or could they change work rules to allow road relief? And again, I want to point out that this is uh, an illustrative, illustrative example, not an actual case study. So uh, please don't call UTA and, and talk to them about what I'm presenting as if it were fact. Uh, so then, they've got uh, their questions, they've got some strategies. Step seven uh, is to implement the strategies that they have identified. <coughs> Eight is monitoring the results. Monitoring results is very important to a successful performance measurement program. The strategy, as the strategies are developed, performance goals should be established. The peer experience allows agencies to set realistic goals, which is important for buy-in by both line managers and senior management. He both short and long-term performance goals. Short-term goals recognize that some changes can be implemented fairly quickly, such as minor adjustments, yeah. time practices, yeah, I've got to check the language. Yeah. evaluated after each operator pick. Long-term goals would reflect strategies that may take over a year to implement, such as instituting road relief, which may require negotiating work rule changes with the union. The peer review itself should be updated periodically, every two years or to every five years, to monitor performance and share successful strategies. Regular communication with peers will help serve as a catalyst for change and for industry improvement. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Linda. Thanks, Catherine. I'd like to share how several state departments of transportation identified potential applications of the peer comparison methodology. Five state DOTs participated in our small-scale testing of this methodology. The DOTs demonstrated the variety of purposes for comparing national peer data. For example, the Florida DOT was interested in a performance comparison of state-funded commuter rail systems. And in another test, Washington State DOT was researching policies for the use of congestion mitigation air quality funding for transit and wanted to gather and compare data not for a single transit system but for a region, looking at multiple transit systems. The methodology and the STIS tool proved very effective not only in identifying peer regions but also in gathering the performance data from multiple transit systems to one database. Some other state DOT interest in the methodology in Texas and Indiana, who also participated in our state DOT review, focused on the analysis of funding and service levels and performance benchmarking. I'd like to show you an example of the use of the methodology as performed specifically for the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, PennDOT. The example I want to show you is the peer comparison and benchmarking exercise for a small urban transit system in Altoona, Pennsylvania. I'll provide some context for the analysis and then illustrate the peer selection methodology, show a comparison of key performance indicators, and summarize how this type of analysis can help to identify strategies to improve performance. Altoona is a small urbanized area. As of uh, census 2010, the population is about 80,000, and the city is in the middle of Pennsylvania. The transit system is Amtran, and in 2010, the system operated about 542,000 vehicle miles in fixed route and demand response service, with an operating budget of about 3.7 million. In Pennsylvania, there is a legislative initiative known as Act 44 that requires the state DOT to conduct periodic performance reviews for transit systems in the state. Act 44 specifies the performance measures, and I've listed three of them here on the screen. Now, one great advantage for this case study and these three uh, requested performance measures is that they are already calculated and accessible directly from the FTIS tool, meaning no additional data the calculations were required. The analysis I'm about to demonstrate can be done in just a few hours, uh, even as you learn the tool and how to do the peer selection methodology. 
Now, first of all, the initial application of the methodology to select peers, we simply entered Altoona as the selected agency and found a long list of potential national peers. As Paul discussed earlier in today's webinar, when the total likeness score, that is the, the number in the middle of the columns, uh, is less than 0 0.50, then there's a very good peer match. For Altoona, we found 10 excellent peers with likeness scores that range from 0 0.01, which is a near perfect match, to 0 0.60. Now, although these peers are all appropriate performance for performance benchmarking, we wanted to narrow the list. One of the values of the uh, TCRP 141 tool is the number of factors that you can explore in screening criteria to narrow your peer group. The database that underlies this particular screen includes other peer grouping factors. And in this case, Altoona, we narrowed the Altoona list of, of peers to consider, for example, the area. We did not include Fairbanks, Alaska. Or we looked at some of the regions that had an increasing regional population, whereas Altoona was looking at a declining or similar uh, population growth rate over the past 10 years. The final group of peers that were used for the analysis were five systems, and these were identified for the benchmarking exercise. These five peers represent small urban systems in four other states, indicating one of the values of the methodology for a state DOT that wants to look at national peer comparisons to data that they otherwise may find familiar. The first performance indicator used for the peer benchmarking exercise was passengers per revenue hour. And this graphic shows how quickly data can be gathered and illustrated by downloading the peer selection database to an Excel spreadsheet and then creating simple bar graphs for the, for the data point passengers per revenue hour. The illustration shows trend data for four years and also comparative statistics for Altoona with five peers. Altoona is competitive for this performance measure, but there are two peers with higher uh, ranking and with a positive trend line. Those are Walsall and uh, Battle Creek. Now, Walsall might be a good peer benchmark for productivity. PennDOT and Altoona could look into the marketing or service design initiatives in Walsall or Battle Creek and find ideas of how to increase ridership. The next Act 44 performance measure that PennDOT wanted to compare for Altoona was the cost per revenue hour. This illustration is from the same database and the same peers. The chart is a comparison of trend lines and shows Altoona and is competitive with other peers for cost efficiency. However, trending up for the last four years while some other peers have been reducing cost per hour. This is an opportunity to investigate further why some transit systems operated at a lower cost per hour and also how other peers are containing cost increases. For example, when Altoona dug a little deeper into the data, they found that one reason for their rising costs was the relatively high cost of maintenance for an aging fleet in comparison to its peers. One final illustration is cost per passenger. In this illustration, we compare peer data by year and also add a couple of trend lines. In this manner, it is possible to compare Altoona cost effectiveness to its peers and also look at trends to identify benchmarks. When measuring cost effectiveness, the lower the bar, the better. Altoona compares favorably, but Wausau is the lowest bar and is really the benchmark. The trend line in blue shows that Altoona, as compared to others, is trending upward, whereas the benchmark for uh, wheeling is trending down. These suggest, again, peers for further investigation of opportunities to contain cost and or increase ridership to improve this performance measure. Now, based on Act 44 performance measures and the peer benchmarking exercise, PennDOT and Altoona developed a set of strategies to improve performance. These strategies illustrated on this slide are from actual uh, result of their uh, 2012 review. And the focus was to contain operating cost increases and also uh, to increase the opportunities to, for ridership in new transit market groups. 
Another one of the strategies was to use the performance goals and metrics for additional areas. So this shows the value of the, of the peer review and performance measurement process. This concludes our demonstration of one example of how a state DOT can use the TCRP 141 methodology and the FTIS tool. I'll now turn the presentation over to Albert to actually demonstrate the software. Uh, just uh, some key points. Performance measurement and peer comparison are, are useful tools for improving agencies' performance. Particularly in these tough financial times, it's important to identify ways to get the most out of existing resources. And peer comparisons are a low-cost way to identify your strengths and weaknesses and identify best practice agencies to learn from. Now, every transit agency has its own unique aspects, but that shouldn't stop you from conducting and learning from a peer comparison. If uh, different companies in completely different industries can can uh, do peer comparisons and learn from each other. Uh, certainly, public transit agencies can. Uh, and we suggest starting now as an agency initiated effort to instill a culture of improvement in the agency, get a head start on identifying and addressing issues before someone else decides to evaluate your performance, and to demonstrate a good stewardship of agency resources to stakeholders. Now, the resources that TCRP Report 141 gives you for doing peer comparisons are examples of uh, benefits of performing peer comparisons and ways you can apply it, uh, case studies of successful programs, guidance on selected performance measures, step-by-step uh, -step guidance on the methodology, uh, detailed instructions on the software that Albert just uh, demonstrated, and details on how the methodology was developed, uh, as well as case studies showing ways to apply the methodology. Uh, we've got the link here to get at the software that uh, Albert demonstrated. Uh, as you mentioned, you need to, there's a one-time registration involved with that, but then you have uh, free access to the software at that point. Uh, where can you get the report? Uh, you can download it from the links we've shown here, uh, either from the Transportation Research Board or through the PCRP Dissemination Program. Uh, you can also buy printed copies from the TRB Bookstore.